Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. On today's episode of LegalCast, we sat down with Trevor Goring, an extraordinary visual artist who has worked closely with the trial lawyer community for several decades. He talked with us about how and why he became an artist, his deep love and admiration for the law, and of course, his beautiful portrait paintings. Hi, this is Elisa D'Amico. I'm here with Trevor Goring, international visual artist and a true visionary. Trevor, thanks for being here with me today. What a delight it is to be here, it really is. It is, and I had the chance to meet you at MTMP and, and saw you last night. Uh, I am always so captivated by you. It's a, as if you walk in the room and there's just this beautiful aura, uh, so much passion and so much joy, so I'm really excited to sit down with you. Um, let's start at the beginning. Tell me how it is that you got into art in the first place. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, I I was pretty good at academics as a kid, and um, I, I but I hated Latin, and um, my Latin master was absolutely brutal. I lived in terror of him, and so um, when I was about fourteen, I went to see my headmaster, and I said, "Look, I can't take this anymore. Would you please demote me, put me in a lower class, and so and and I can take art." And um, he agreed, uh, surprisingly, in those days. Sure. Headmasters weren't very empathetic. And who were you? Um, I was in uh, London. Okay. I grew up in London. Very fortunate. Um, my, my school was on the grounds of the mansion of Sir Walter Raleigh. It was an extraordinary school, very beautiful. It was a free public school there. Um, but so. I started to take art classes and uh, found that I had a facility for for making things and um, it was a very good school and there were some outreach classes at uh, various art schools in Kingston and Wimbledon and places like that and one thing led to another and I saw it as a, as a career for myself. I moved to Montreal and went to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts there. And then returned to London and did a, a master's at St. Martin's College of Art. And when I returned to Montreal, we got very actively involved in um, art communities and running a major art gallery, which led to publishing art magazines. Wow. Um, and then I branched out a little bit more into the commercial world and established um, an arts and entertainments magazine, um, a sort of a listings magazine, like Time Out, for instance, sure. um, but in French. And um, that was an extraordinary experience. Um, one that almost killed me, uh, if the workload was so huge. Publishing is not for the faint-hearted. No. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I did, did very well, exhibited in national galleries and museums. And, and it was portraiture? No, not at all. Okay, um, tell me about that. Um, very contemporary artwork, um, performance art, uh, video art. It was a time in the 70s when, when uh, the art world was exploding. Uh, new music, uh, new dance, uh, poetry readings um, and performances, and they were all happening in the visual art realm, in the art galleries. You can see it in people like David Bowie, for instance, you know, came from, from art school. John Lennon came from art school. You sure. know, was, um, and I pursued that career until my 40s. And one day I woke up and realized that I wanted a change. Would you remember being there and, and sort of what went through your head? What was it that made you want to change? Well, I was intensely involved in politics and art politics, and I was just, I, I had just had too much of it. And, and what's art politics? Well, artists getting together to try and um, run a cooperative, for instance, or to um, fight for the rights of artists. Um, artists don't tend to get along very well with each other. <laughs> And so there tends to be a great deal of conflict or sure. misunderstanding and everything. And sure. I was simply tired of it. I'd had enough. 
I can understand. And, and um, I looked around for a community that I could truly admire, that I could, that I felt would really inspire me. And I thought long and hard about it. And one thing led to another, and I found criminal defense lawyers and plaintiff civil litigators. Okay, and I need to stop you there for a minute. What, what, how did that process work? Did you think about, maybe I'll think about physicians or yes, you I know, did. politicians, and then I you did. stopped on lawyers. What, what was it that interested well, you? I knew that who, whatever community I chose, it had to be a community that had a fascinating history. Because I wanted to be able to um, have a lot of inspirational source material. And I did consider the medical world, but I'm a little skeptic of uh, the medical world. Uh, I've always been very um, supportive of alternative health treatments and prevention rather than taking pills. Um, but I did look at the history of the medical world, and it, and it is quite fascinating. But when I started to look at the history of law, I was simply blown away. I mean, you just the, the early biblical images, you sure. so, the judgment of Solomon, you know, Ezra reading the laws of Moses, you know, outside the walls of Jerusalem, the Egyptian goddess of Justice Ma'at, who wears the feather of truth in her in her headdress, a symbol which native Indians in North America still use today, um, and then right on through the the medieval period and the Renaissance, there are images of justice everywhere. Yeah. And so I founded this this project called Images of Justice, and. Um, started to, to take that imagery and make it my own, right. and make it relevant for today. And, and when you started the project, what, what was the project? What did it do? Did you look at the images and, and talk about them and, and teach people? What was the... the no, I tended it? to um, do an enormous amount of research, uh, um, really not um, online at the time, you know, I would spend days in the McGill University Rare Book Library and... Uh, right. When you um, had to turn actual pages. Absolutely, and take photographs of them. And, uh, yeah. and so I, I would be constantly gathering source material. Um, you know, this morning Ben Crump made an extraordinary comment. Um, it was a quote from Martin Luther King, and the, the punchline really was, it came down to how it is one's conscience that is the most important thing. And um, I, I found in a, um, a very rare um, book in the McGill Library um, an image of conscience, a, a wonderful image of a woman walking a narrow path between flowers and thorns symbolizing the easy and difficult paths in life and as she walks she reflects upon herself in a mirror and I, I, I linked this with a, a quote which said even when there is no law there is conscience and so, I mean very powerful you know how could you not and, and it was a very simple line drawing. It was in a book which would have been used by journeyman sculptors who traveled around France and traveled around Europe. Um, and as they entered into a, a town or a village, they would be commissioned. And they would look in this sort of reference book of, of, of images that, that spoke to allegories and spoke to values. Yeah. And, and this one of conscience just blew me away. And I, um, I, I, I remember making a painting of it in my own way. And I have to tell you that that particular image, I have sold hundreds and hundreds of them. And I sold every single one to a woman. And the number of women who have come back to me over the years and said to me, Trevor, when I'm having a really bad day, 
when my client is being impossible, when things are, just couldn't go any worse, I close the door and I look at that image of conscience and it reminds me why I do what I do. And that is very similar to what was going through my head when you were talking about it. Really? It, it's true and, and I, uh, I love art, I've always loved art and there are several images throughout my life that have always captivated me and I always go back there when there are difficult times. I'm a very visual thinker and so I just always go back there and that to me just, it spoke to me, right, the, the imagery of it. So I understand that there's a couple of Picassos that I specifically feel drawn to but I, I think it's beautiful and I will make one. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, you know, art I think is uh, just, it's something that can bring people together. Obviously it could tear people apart if they're fighting over, you know, the artist community but um, when you, started working for attorneys and in that space and doing your research, how did your art evolve uh, from this new community that you, that you joined? Well, it was a huge challenge for me because I had really never worked in a figurative manner. You know, I, when, when I was at art school and studying and, and then as I developed my, my career, um, I was not working in a traditional way whatsoever. And so, when I started this work, I was, I was challenged to really get up to speed on the traditional um, values of painting and drawing. Um, and so the early works were um, very graphic, a lot of line drawing, um, a lot of uh, um, wash coloring, um, not, not really painting as such, um, sure. more sort of... Um, and, and I, coming from the publishing background, you know, I had a real sense of graphics. And, um, but one thing led to another, and one day somebody said to me, um, oh, can you paint me a painting of Oliver Wendell Holmes? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And got back to the studio, started tearing my hair out, and never having had a, painted a portrait in my life. And, um, and, but, you know, one rises to the occasion, and uh, that, that started me off, and um, shortly afterwards, uh, um, a wonderful man in Atlanta, Nick Lotito, um, asked me if I would paint a portrait of Bobby Lee Cook, the great um, Georgian trial criminal defense lawyer after whom Matlock was uh, based, and um, that was just so exciting. And, um, I, 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 I painted that painting, it was a great success, it was very well received, uh, I believe it hangs in the Georgia Supreme Court, and um, that was it, How long to does the it races. Take? <laughs> how long does it take, I guess maybe you've, uh, you know, we can do it more quickly over time, but how long does a portrait take, what is the process? I usually, I usually ask um, a client for a minimum of three months. Um, and that's really just for the painting. Uh, there's a lot of preparatory work involved. And then once the painting is finished, there's a lot of other work, um, you know, finishing, varnishing, scanning, uh, that sort of thing. Right. Um, so it's really a six month process. Wow. That, and that's a, that's a lot of work and a lot of love into one painting. Yes, and I always have at least, um, at least half a dozen, if not, you know, 10 or 12 paintings going on at the same time. Do you go from one to the other or just work on one? You know, you, you develop blind spots when you're, when you're working on things. So, so you, you, you work away at it, you're sort of at the coal face, you're, you know, you're working away and then you, then you put the painting aside and you go off to a conference or what have you and uh, you come back and you, you, you take a fresh look at it and you think, oh my God, how could I have missed that? You know, <laughs> Um, so, so that's also an, an integral part of the process. You need to give it time. Sure. Yeah. I do this with writing. I, I, I can draw great stick figures, but beyond that, not so much. But I do that with writing. I have to put it down, take you know, step away, come back, and then I said, how did I write that? That doesn't make any sense. Let's do it this way. Yeah. Um, I'm still fascinated by you finding lawyers fascinating. What about criminal defense lawyers and plaintiff's lawyers draws you to them? Specifically, oh, it's, it's undoubtedly um, the commitment, the passion, and the sense of compassion, um, the sense of justice, 
a true sense of justice. They really are, as my Papa Antonio said this morning, they truly are the front line. Uh, you know, the awesome power of the state is terrifying. And when it is, when it is exercised in the way that it is in the United States, it is brutal and unbelievably unfair, unequal, and unjust. And it is only the criminal defense lawyers who stand between that awesome power and an individual who deserves every possible chance of a proper defense. And with plaintiff civil litigators, the, the, the extraordinary greed and horrendous indifference to human suffering that is practiced by corporations who only have the bottom line in mind right. um, and has been and, and that position has been so devastating for so many so many communities, so many individuals, so many ethnic groups, um, that these plaintiff civil litigators who take on these cases at, entirely at their own risk and who step up to the plate and who, who make sure that their clients are taken care of in their time of need. What more could you want? But superheroes in a way. So, tell me about how you get clients, how you choose who you want to paint. Uh, what's well, I operate on two levels. <laughs> okay. um, you know, obviously there's the, there's, I need to make a living, and so um, that only happens um, through personal contact. So, the COVID area was very difficult for me, not to be able to travel, not to be able to meet my, my clients. Sure. Um, Usually commissions come because I've been working this community for over 30 years. And I, I know people well. I've known them for a very long time. It's, there's a, it's a very, very, very long sales cycle. Um, but sometimes things just fall into place, right. such as yesterday. Um, I ran into Scott Carruthers, uh, the former executive director of Florida Justice Association, who told me that Ben Crump had uh, just endowed St. Thomas University here with a million dollars for a new social justice center. So wonderful. And um, I said to him, well, of course, you know, they should get a portrait of, of Mr. Crump, somebody I've been wanting to paint for a while anyway. and. Um, and so I, he gave me the dean's number, and I contacted her, and she was on board immediately with it. So you know that's that's one sure. source. That's um, but at the same time, I always have at least half a dozen paintings going of people that I know I will never get any money out of. I mean, I mean that I'll never make any money from. Sure. They may be historical characters, or they may be contemporary characters. Um, that I just absolutely want to have in the National Portrait Gallery, in the trial or National Portrait Gallery, right. because they they're just so um, so worthy, and and I admire them so much, and, and so um, you know I'll, I'll just go ahead and do the research and create the paintings. Yes. And and can you tell me about the gallery that you're talking about, the trial or gallery? Yes, um, this um, this came about. Um, about four years ago now, um, so a good 26 odd years into the Images of Justice project, um, I realized that I had accumulated a, a sort of, uh, I'd reached a sort of critical mass where I had a really great um, body of work because even though when I create paintings and I sell them, I retain the copyright. So, um, so I realized that I wanted to shift the focus somewhat from myself as the artist Trevor Goring to shift the focus to those who I paint. And I, I thought long and hard about how I best could do that. And I felt that um, some kind of portrait gallery 
would be appropriate. Now, there is the Trial Lawyer Hall of Fame, which was established by Mike Papantonio at Temple University in, in Philadelphia, um, which is a wonderful initiative. But it, it tends to be rather political. It's, it's very exclusive. Um, and um, my, my National Portrait Gallery, which is a digital gallery, um, is much more wide-ranging, much more comprehensive, much more inclusive. Um, and um, it has really gained an, a, a great deal of attention and, and traction, and I, I'm very proud of it, and I hope that it will uh, eventually become a, a great legacy for the community. Well, it, it's beautiful. And you've actually done a nice lead into my, my next question, which is, what is that legacy that you want to leave behind? Um, it's not really my legacy. It's the legacy of all these extraordinary people. That's, that's yeah. Well, you're doing it. And, and you were talking about reading about history and learning about the history of law. But you're a part of that now. And as history you know, is in the making, um, you're very much a part of that community. And in the future, I know people will look at these portraits and learn about the stories, and all of the hard work you've done is, is right there for everyone to learn from. So you've made such beautiful contributions to, to everything, to art, to law, to history. It's, it's really extraordinary. It's a privilege. This whole journey has been a privilege. I feel I feel privileged to sit here. I feel so so happy and so lucky um, and so blessed. And um, I'd love to ask you about uh, your painting of RBG of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and tell me a little about that project and uh, your involvement there. Yeah, what, what a great project. Um, uh, in Canada, um, I have been very fortunate um, to. Um, be recognized by a number of the Canadian Supreme Court justices and um, had, uh, had some extraordinary experiences, invited to have lunch in their private dining room and, 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 and spend time with Chief Justice Be Beverly McLachlan and, and a number of the other justices. Um, I was, God knows why they chose me on the uh, the Rhodes Scholarship Selection Committee for a few years, and, and uh, for Canada, and uh, was the only, uh, you know, non-Oxford uh, graduate there, and, and it was moderated by one of our Canadian Supreme Court justices, Justice Fish, Morris Fish, and he equally invited me to to the Supreme Court. So, so I had some sense of, of, of Supreme Courts, and then um, I was very fortunate. Before 9-11, I was down in Washington, and uh, I made some connections with the Supreme Court Historical Society, and they showed me all around the Supreme Court. I got to go in all the back beautiful staircases and, and, and the old Supreme Court building, you know, and wow. uh, it was just, I was just fascinated by it all. And, and, um, and then I was commissioned to paint a portrait of Sonia Sotomayor which was uh, a wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity. And uh, she loved the portrait. What a wonderful woman. She, so a woman who wonderful. made you feel you were the only person in the room, even though you know, you'd be surrounded by hundreds of people. Um, so when it came to paint um, Justice Ginsburg, Madam Justice Ginsburg, um, I was very excited. And I just wanted to show her in her elegance and in her, in her beauty and, um, and so, you know, I spent an enormous amount of time um, scrolling through thousands of images of her, um, looking for just the right, you know, facial expression, just the right gesture and, and just the right outfit. And, uh, <laughs> and found her wearing on one occasion this exquisite Chinese silk embroidered blouse. 
uh, I thought once I saw that, I thought, oh God, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I put together the painting, kept it very simple. It's a small painting. Um, and um, sent off a, a print to, to Washington. Um, that might have caused a bit of a stir. I, I, you know, I, I've worked very closely with a congressman, Matt Cartwright, who's a great trial lawyer um, from Scranton. Um, and uh, realized that you know people in these very important public positions really can't accept gifts. Um, you know, there's a whole protocol. It's a, it's, it's a very delicate issue. Um, but the the RBG painting gathered a lot of a lot of reaction, a lot of commentary, and um, I wanted it to make its own way. I wanted it to. Um, be a vehicle for furthering uh, RBG's mission, and so I donated it to raise funds. Amazing. What a, what a wonderful story and something that is very uh, her, right? That, that very much is the kind of person she was and Absolutely. leaving something behind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, you know, the law is an incredible place to work. And a lot of times what you get are uh, written transcripts of those arguments, sometimes oral transcripts, so you can listen to them, but other than the, the courtroom drawings, you know, nobody really captures that visually other than photographs. So it's, it's really nice to have that component of it um, as you know, part of, of building history. Who else are you hoping to paint in your lifetime? Is there a person or a figure or a group of people that are on your list, your wish list? I'm very interested to see who uh, is nominated as the next Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly very interesting. And, um, well, there was probably a long list of, of people and I'm, I'm always uh, amazed by just how many wonderful, wonderful trial lawyers there are. Um, and that's the beauty of what I do. It's, it's, they're, they're, it's limitless. It, it is. I mean, and there are younger trial lawyers who are just starting out on their careers and already making a big path for themselves. So the practice of law is changing and growing, and um, you know, it, it certainly is amazing to see what people are doing. When you paint, though, when you when you paint portraits or uh, you know, sort of learn about individuals, how do you? capture and memorialize that information. Right? So with, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, you know, Justice Ginsburg, did you have a research file? Um, you know, all of that work behind your portraiture. Yeah, there's a huge amount so critical. there's a huge amount of research work. And that's because well first of all the the reality is, you know, you, you, you just can't get people to sit for you. Um, nobody has the time. You know, I mean it takes months to get an appointment with a Supreme Court Justice and, right. you know, and they can barely spare three quarters of an hour, you know, so, so you, if, you, if you do have that opportunity, you take photographs, you make notes, um, but because often I'm dealing with historical figures or people who are so incredibly busy, um, I, I love to, to draw on their public persona, after all that is who they are. And um, that is their achievement. And, and so I'm really good at trolling through, you know, thousands of images and, and just zeroing in on one or two that will suit my purpose. And then I always try to um, situate my subject um, in a context which speaks to their achievements, which speaks to their passion. And um, that can be done in, in a great variety of ways. Um, one lovely way that I like to do it, and I've done for a number of attorneys, um, is you know, their, um, your bookcase is very revealing about who you are. Sure and I, is. <laughs> I've become an expert at painting book spines, <laughs> you know, which, is a, which actually is a very meditative thing to do. And, I bet. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was a big discussion when all of the you know, when COVID hit and everything became virtual, 
everyone was talking not so much about an interview with someone, you know, some public figure, but what was behind them, right? What's on their bookshelf, right. and, and right. trying to read that. Sure. So, sure. So, yeah. Yeah, and then you saw yeah. people who just clearly set books up to make it look like they were reading them, and right. and they weren't. Um, but no, that that's really interesting. Uh, have you ever painted yourself a self-portrait? I have, and a family portrait. Um, but a good time, a good while ago, and um, I'm not sure I want to revisit that. I, no. I'm happy painting others. <laughs> Would you let someone else paint you so that you had a portrait? That's a very good question. I never really thought about it. Um, well, you're painting all of these wonderful public figures and part of history, and you're part of it. I think that I think that we should make that happen. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, there are so many amazing portrait painters out there. Um, I have a very um, cobbled together approach to portrait painting. It doesn't look I, like I, it on the painting. I, I, you know, I, 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 um, I, I, my paintings probably do stand out from most portrait painters because I have no formal training as a portrait painter. And so I, I don't approach portrait painting in the traditional manner. Nearly all really accomplished portrait painters are painting in oil, mm -hmm. um, and they they put it they do the they do the the underpainting you know they they they, they put in the shadows uh, sure. you know and then they, they, they there's a whole process that is that is pretty much followed by you know ninety five percent of portrait painters. By everyone out else, there. and you don't and use oil. No, I don't use oil because I came from a very contemporary background, sure. I, so I stuck with acrylics. Yeah. Um, they dry very fast. They're not really that suited to portrait, to traditional portrait painting. But I've struggled through and found my own way. And sometimes I despair at my uh, at my inability to capture what I want. <laughs> and then sometimes it falls into place. <laughs> well, it's absolutely beautiful. It really is. It, it's sort of, you know, like a, some of the best meals that I've had are not cooked by professional chefs, right? Yeah. It, it's just, I think there's a lot of love and, and passion that goes into it and, and it and it really shines through. And hard work. You know, I used to, as a youngster, we used to look at, you know, um, great master paintings, you know, and you stand there in awe and say, how on earth could you possibly do that? And you know, you begin to realize that, well, first of all, they had all sorts of apprentices. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they had tried and true techniques, and they just spent endless hours yeah. working on the paintings. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really a very spiritual person. Um, I find it very hard to sort of meditate, you know, uh, um, in a traditional way. But... I go into my studio and start painting and sometimes, you know, I find myself five or six hours later and I haven't even realized, you know, I put on a CD and the CD is finished and I'm oblivious <laughs> to it and I've been in there in silence for right. four or five hours and, you know, sort of... Um, you just disappear into it. Yeah. What yeah. type of music do you listen to while you paint? Um, you know, I, it depends. Um, in the mornings, I listen to um, cello. Um, I played you know, the cello. Pablo Casals. You know, I knew we, I knew uh, we were kindred spirits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and especially, especially adagios. You know, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, these days you can you know go on Spotify, and I'm not too pleased with them these days. But you know, <laughs> you can go go on and put in cello adagios, and you just get incredible music. Or I love I love the Baroque. Period. I, I adore Baroque music. Uh, maybe because my daughter is a, um, um, a, a, a Baroque dancer. Um, wow, that's wonderful. Has danced all over the world uh, in, in Baroque operas and things like that. But uh, I guess she introduced me to that that music, and I, I love that music. And then as the day progresses, you know, I put on. You know, I, I love Bob Marley. I love early reggae. Um, you know, I love Motown. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I'll never forget as a, a youngster in London um, going to Brixton, which was a very intense sort of West Indian Caribbean community, um, and uh, I must have been about four or 
14, and I went to this party, and um, there were DJs. You know, I had never, I, I was a little innocent white kid, you know, I not a clue. And, uh, you know, they had, these, they had these little 45 singles that had come direct from Jamaica, you know, didn't have any labels on them, right? And they were spinning them, and it was like one drop, you know, Scar and Blue Beat and stuff. And, and then, you know, these, these, these wonderful, warm sort of women would come up and say, hey, you know, let's dance, you know? And stuff. <laughs> and it was just, just so exciting, magical, you know, yeah. magical. And, uh, and then I, I lived in the Caribbean for a while. And, oh, and, whereabouts? Um, St. Vincent. Okay. And, um, that was a wonderful experience. And so I have a great love for the, the music of the islands. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Where else did you live? I mean, it sounds like you've lived in Europe, in Canada. I, um, Where else? I lived in Italy for a while, um, learned Italian, wanted to be able to understand uh, operas because sure. I do love Verdi and um, uh, bought a house in Assisi which I lost to the Catholic Church is a very long story. Um, oh boy. That was very interesting. Um, that's another that's like a whole other interview. story. Um, lived in Ireland for, for seven years. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful country. I, I go back in a heartbeat. I, I, I do go back every year. I have many, many great friends there. Um, lived in Greece. Wow. Uh, I lived in Greece when the military junta was in power and got involved in some uh, acts of subversion that I could carry out that nobody else could because I was a foreigner and right. uh, it was a pretty brutal regime put in place by the American government, I might say. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Um, and now I'm living in France. What part of France? Alsace. Oh, beautiful. Close to Basel. Yeah. So you went... You lived all over the world in all these beautiful places. But always kept um, um, a, um, an industrial studio space in Montreal. In Montreal. Yeah. And through all of that and all of the people that you've met in your life, you wound up on trial lawyers. Yeah. That is unbelievable to me. <laughs> it's so special. And I, and I know that everyone in the community uh, you know, reveres you for your work and for the attention that you're giving all of these individuals. I keep meeting different plaintiff's lawyers. I worked for a criminal defense lawyer, so I understand what you're talking about. But to me, you know, I think sometimes plaintiff's lawyers get a bad reputation for you know, being ambulance chasers and all that stuff, but every single person that I've met has been a voice for the voiceless, right? Someone who's standing up for people who don't have the ability to do it themselves, and, and there really is that passion. So I see that in you, right, in us, uh, you know, trying to, um, to make the world better through whatever way that we can. Yes, I mean that public perception of, of, of those two groups is, you know, has been foisted on the public through a concerted and uh, ruthless campaign mounted by, you know, the, the, the chambers of commerce and, the, and big pharma and, yeah. and big industries and, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's not by coincidence that people oh, not at all. have that perspective. Not at all. It's been, and they it's just been baked in. don't get it. Unfortunately, they just don't understand. Well, hopefully through you know, interviews like this, your work, uh, people telling stories and talking, everyone else on the outside can learn the truth about what trial lawyers are working on and the, the true passion that, that they've got to, to really change people's lives. That really is part of my mission, is to just incrementally somehow try and make a bit of a dent in that, in that perception that people have and to, to try and show just how extraordinary this community is. And you very much are. You, you are doing that. It's happening Thank you. right now. Thank you very much. Trevor, what's next uh, for you, the projects that are you know, on your timeline or that you're looking forward to whether this year or in the next few years? Um, well, that's hard to say. Um, you know, obviously continuing on in this in this manner. I would, I would like eventually for this that for my 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 trial on National Portrait Gallery to um, perhaps become part of a um, a, a university um, law program 
you know, so that the so its continuity is ensured. You know, I'm not I'm 72 now. It's you know I mean I'm not you know I don't know how long you know that's going to be able to go on. And so um, you know I'm I'm healthy, but one never knows. And um, so I, I'd like to I'd like to gradually work, work towards trying to place it in a way in which it will be appreciated and continue. That's wonderful. Well, we're so happy that you were talking to us today. I am overjoyed, uh, and hopefully this can be part of, of that legacy that you're, that you're leaving, the story that you're telling. And uh, my hope is, and, and we'll do the best we can to make sure everyone can hear it. I'm lucky enough to have met you in person and be able to sit down with you, but not everyone can. Uh, so, uh, you know, really thank you so much for all that you're doing. Uh, for being here, for always being present. I mean, you really do, sort of like uh, Justice Sotomayor. When you're talking to me, I feel like you're here, right, in the moment, and so many people get lost on the outside and, and don't do that, so thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you. I have a sense of purpose. I, I feel totally blessed to have creativity within me and to be able to make things. It, it, it is the most rewarding thing in life. That is for me the great satisfaction. I, I complete painting and I sit there and stare at it for hours and it just fills me up. What I do now. I would have spent more time with my mother. Being from a traditional English family, you know, there's, you know, we're not like the Greeks and Italians who hug each other, you know, there's a lot of reserve, a lot of um, formality, um, and although we all loved each other dearly, dearly, didn't have that time together. I did, I was fortunate in, the, in, in her last years, but you know, I left home when I was very young. I was still going to high school when I left home, living in a squat in London, uh, having to put on my school uniform and go, go to school, uh, you know, it was pretty strange. Um, and, um, then, and then I left and went to Montreal and I didn't see any of my family for decades you know, so, and didn't really think about it. You know, and talk a couple of times a year. I wish I'd spend more time. If you need proven cases delivered, Torticity is your solution. Our proprietary platform includes an extensive suite of tools designed exclusively for mass tort case management while deferring cost until time of settlement. We use our expertise so you can focus on yours. 